So we're going to continue talking about energy-based models. And uh, we've talked about um, contrastive methods. Uh, and we've talked about non-contrastive methods in the context of joint embedding. And today we're going to talk about architectural methods and uh, regularized latent variable models. Um, so this is more for self-supervised learning than supervised learning, really. Um, last time we also talked about structure prediction, and you're going to have uh, homework on that topic that uh, Vlad is preparing for you, uh, which is pretty cool, I have to say. So part three of energy-based models. Okay, so we've talked about contrastive learning, uh, which are methods where you explicitly push down on points in the uh, from the training set, uh, whether it's the conditional version where you have an X variable and a Y variable, or whether, and they may be, of course, multidimensional, all of them, or they could be discrete or continuous, and the unconditional version where you only have Ys. So you never know which one will be known or not known. Maybe none of them will be known. Um, and the name of the game in contrastive methods is that whenever you have a point from the training sample, from the training set, you push down on this energy, and then you have to have some way of producing points outside of the manifold of data, if you want, or the, the set of training samples, and you push, you push their energy up. Uh, we've seen various ways of doing this, either using the negative log likelihood loss function, which you know, basically pushes everywhere, uh, um, you know, kind of push, pulls out the energy everywhere, uh, uh, kind of Monte Carlo methods or sampling methods where you approximate the negative load likelihood by a set of finite points that you have to choose by sampling from the distribution that your model gives to uh, points in the space. And we've seen other ways to uh, use contrastive methods where you, you plug either a pair of energies of good and bad energies into a loss function. And the loss function has to be an increasing function of the energy of the good point and a decreasing function of the energy of the bad points in such a way that one will get pushed down, the other one pushed up, uh, perhaps until the difference between them is large enough that you don't need to, to push anymore. So you can do this with a hinge loss, um, or you can have sort of a generalized loss, which is the one that's written here, where you take a whole bunch of positive samples and a whole bunch of negative samples, and you have some complicated way of you know, pushing down and pulling up on, on those various terms. Uh, we've seen a very popular example of this for joint embedding methods uh, called uh, uh, NCE or InfoNCE, uh, noise contrastive estimation. The, that's what NCE stands for, but they're basically the same thing. <laughs> okay, so that was for contrastive methods. And the problem with contrastive met methods that we discussed last time is that uh, they are very expensive because there are many ways for points to be different from outside of the manifold of data. So generally in an ambient space of high dimension, the, 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 the space occupied by the data is actually a very, very small volume within that space. Could be a manifold, a low-dimensional manifold within a, a high-dimensional uh, space. We've, we've seen examples of this at the beginning of the class where I said, you know, what is the dimension, the intrinsic dimension of a manifold that would be a collection of all the possible picture of someone's face, turning the head around, making faces, et cetera, assuming the hairs don't move. Um, and we've seen that the dimension of that uh, manifold would be something like less than 100, probably around 50 or so, because it's limited by the number of degrees of freedom in your face, which is around 50. Um, so, um, so there, you know, the, the image is a point in a 1 million dimensional space, if it's a, a grayscale 1,000 by 1,000 image or something like that. Uh, and your, the, the space that is occupied by the data is a tiny, tiny sliver in that space. It's very complicated, but it's a tiny sliver. So uh, here is the problem. The problem is that there are many, many, many dimensions uh, in which you can move that will move you outside of that manifold of data. And so if you have to pull up on, on sort of every place uh, to, to make sure the energy takes the right shape, uh, it might become very expensive. And indeed, it is very expensive. Uh, so the situation where it works are contrastive methods for joint embedding, things like SimClear, for example, um, and you know, Sami's nets in general. Uh, where the you you know you also push down and pull up, uh, you generate negative samples by picking pairs that are you know dissimilar from your training set, uh, and the similar pairs are generated by distorting uh, an image uh, uh, into a different version of itself. Uh, so you can have essentially as much data as you want, uh, and this works okay, but it's very expensive, and 
it only works if the dimension of the embedding space in which you you know you measure the distance is relatively small. Uh, why small? Because the smaller it is, then the the the, the fewer dimensions you're you're going to have to explore to to pull up on stuff. Uh, so that's the that's the thing. So now we're going to talk about and so we've seen that in the context of joint embedding, there are also methods that are not really contrastive. They don't explicitly push up on the energy of data points. They 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 make sure the energy is higher through other means. Uh, some of the means are understood, like uh, in the case of the Barlow twin uh, method that I presented last week, which is very fresh from the press, right? It just came up on archive last week. Um, or, uh, uh, or through mechanisms that are not fully understood, like BYOL, bring your own latent, where there seems to be an implicit contrastive thing going on, but without explicitly pushing on points. Um, uh, but it's not fully understood why that happens, and it, it, it's connected with normalization of various kinds. There's a lot of research uh, in this domain. It's very hot. And in fact, the, the project you'll be given um, uh, will uh, actually address this. So um, th this will be related to uh, you know, asking you to do self-supervised running on a relatively large collection of unlabeled uh, images. And then we'll be given, you'll be given kind of a small uh, number of label samples and uh, on which you can, you can fine tune uh, supervised. And you'll be given the choice of what method to, uh, to implement, including things you can you know, pull out of the literature. Um, things like joint embedding or like you know, stacked autoencoders or whatever method you wanna, you wanna use. I, I would uh, discourage you from using GANs because uh, GANs don't seem to work very well for running features. And they're also a little finicky. Okay, so I gave you this big eye chart in the past, and I'm, I'm going to show it to you versions of it uh, multiple times, which uh, kind of tried to classify some classical machine learning methods, whether supervised, unsupervised, or or, or whatever, uh, into the contrastive methods and the regularized uh, or architectural methods. So we're going to concentrate on the uh, the list at the bottom here. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to go through all of it, but uh, at least to the first two. Uh, or subset of the first two. I might talk about the last one, but if I don't, doesn't matter too much because I think Alfredo is going to tell you about that. And I may mention the the, the very last one if I uh, uh, if I have time. So let's uh, let's focus on the the regularized and architectural method. And to kind of get an intuitive understanding of what this does, I'll uh, uh, you know I'll. I'll kind of recast some classical algorithms that I'm sure you've heard of uh, in the in the context of energy-based model. Uh, I already sort of alluded to this alluded to this in previous lectures, but I think it's worth revisiting. Okay, so let's start with architectural methods. So architectural methods uh, consist in constructing the machine so that the volume of low-energy space is fixed or limited um, by construction, essentially. Um, so. There are basically different uh, ways of, if there are latent variable models, they're not all latent variable models, but if there are latent variable models, there are different ways of limiting the information capacity of the latent representation or of the representation uh, from which the, the, the prediction is, is produced. Um, so, uh, you know, first set of techniques, build a machine in such a way that the volume of low energy space is bounded. Uh, so here's a bunch of techniques that you may have heard of, Principal component analysis, the volume uh, is the dimension of the principal subspace. And so it's limited because the dimension is limited. I'll show you an explicit example here to visualize what happens. K means the volume is limited by the number of prototypes. So this is the volume of low energy space, right? So you figure out like, you know, how much of the ambient space of, of Y of the variable I'm trying to model uh, can take low energy because of the way I constructed the machine. Um, then there are analytical normalized probabilistic models. So things where you know you write a probability distribution, you know it's normalized because it's got all the terms to make it normalized. Uh, let's say a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so a Gaussian distribution has a fixed uh, volume of high probability because the probability has to integrate to one. Okay, uh, so if you make the uh, you know if you make the the, the the variance large, you know the the, the top of the distribution kind of goes down because the volume has to be one. Uh, so Gaussian 
are an example. There are other, you know, such uh, distributions which you know you can explicitly normalize. You can guarantee that the volume is is one because the expression of the the, the energy, if you want, is simple enough that when you take e to the minus, you can compute the constant that you need to normalize uh, with. Okay. In the case of uh, Gaussian distributions, this constant is proportional to the determinant of the covariance matrix of that of that Gaussian. And there is, you know, a bunch of pi's and square roots and stuff, you know, in there, you know, the formula. Uh, Gaussian mixture is basically just like Gaussian, except you have multiple of them. And, and the Gaussian mixture model is a linear combination of this uh, Gaussian components where the coefficients are all between zero and one and sum to one. And so, uh, so in the end, uh, it's still a normalized model and it's easy to normalize, okay? So density models in probabilistic modeling uh, that are explicitly normalized, uh, you know, are architectural models, if you want. Where it becomes a non-architectural model is when the normalization constant is difficult to compute or intractable. And there you basically have to just use the energy and push down and pull up because you don't know uh, how to explicitly compute the normalization term. And we've seen that. Uh, something I'm not gonna talk about much is independent component analysis. Um, so there's forms of this that are essentially architectural methods. Uh, uh, others that are more regularized methods, but I'm not going to go into this very much. And then there is uh, latent variable models with a fixed latent distribution. Okay, so where the volume is, uh, the volume of low energy stuff is basically limited by the, the volume of the latent variable uh, prior distribution. Uh, an example of this is normalizing flow. I'm, I'm not going to talk about this today. I may talk about this in a future lecture, I'm not sure. Um, this is rather, you know, normalizing flows are kind of rather uh, recent models that, uh, you know, have some applications in things like physics and stuff like that, but they, they, they're still very much at the research level uh, and, and fairly complicated. But I encourage you to read about it if you're interested. Okay, so let's talk about principal component analysis in the context of energy-based models. So let's, let's assume that we have a set of training samples that are sampled around this little spiral here in 2D, right? So our wave vector is a point in the 2D plane uh, and our training set is, is drawn from, you know, that, that spiral here, um, a few thousand points or, or whatever. And we're gonna, uh, we're gonna ask ourselves, what is PCA? So PCA is basically an autoencoder model. Okay, so we've, we've uh, alluded to this uh, idea of autoencoder. You take a Y, you run it through an encoder uh, then you run the result through a decoder. Uh, you get a prediction for a reconstruction for Y, and then you measure the distance between the reconstructed Y and the original Y, and that would be the energy, okay? So generally speaking, the energy is something like this. Uh, uh, in fact, it's a free energy because there's no latent variable. So F uh, prime which by W of Y is uh, Y minus the decoder applied to the encoder applied to Y, and both the encoder and the decoder are parameterized by uh, you know, a parameter vector, abstract parameter vector y, which I didn't put explicitly here. Uh, and you can measure the, the square distance, the Euclidean distance, or, um, you know, whatever, whatever discrepancy measure. It doesn't need to be a distance, actually. It needs to be a divergence of some kind. So it's good if it's zero when the two things are equal, but it doesn't mean to be, it doesn't need to be symmetric or to satisfy the triangular inequality or anything like that. Um, but it's missing a y, right, in the equation on the energy, I think. I'm missing a y in the equation. It's y minus w transpose w times... Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, sorry about that. You're good, good point. Yeah, so I was going to this, to this formula. Yeah, there is a missing y here. Uh, absolutely right. So essentially in PCA, you constrain the encoder and the decoder to be linear. And what, what's more, you constrain them to be transposed of each, of each other. Okay. Uh, so basically, you see v, you see W as a projection uh, into a low-dimensional space, a linear projection, and then you see W transpose as the projection back into the bigger space. Okay, um, uh, yeah, and there is a Y here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so this is the architecture. Okay, and the energy function is just that. And if we train PCA, um, so the way you train PCA, you can just solve that system. Okay, so. Uh, square minimization with respect to some variable, you can solve it using, uh, it's basically, uh, uh, you know, eigenvector, eigenvalue problem. Or you can do it through gradient descent through least square. It works too, okay? Uh, using shared weights here. It's the same matrix. It will work. The difference that you will get if you solve this with gradient descent is that the 
the, the Z vector you will get or the W matrix you will get will be equal to the, the one you would get through the regular, regular PCA up to a rotation. Because in regular PCA, what you get is a eigen decomposition. I mean, you get the, the projection into the uh, eigenspace of the covariance matrix of the, of the Ys uh, of your training set. Whereas here, if you just do least square, uh, you get the subspace, uh, the projection into the subspace, but the, the basis in that subspace is not determined. Um, so uh, up to a rotation in that space, you'll get, you'll get the same result. Um, right, okay, so if you train PCA with this uh, little spiral here, the principal axis, so essentially the linear subspace that best approximates your, 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 your training samples, which in other words, minimizes the square distance between uh, uh, any point on that surface and any training sample, okay? So you take, uh, you take a point on the, on the surface, that's a Y, okay, on, on, the, on the manifold of training data, that's, that's one of the Y. You project on the linear subspace, that's, that's a, a Z bar, and, and then you multiply by uh, W transpose, and now what you have are the coordinates of this point in the original two-dimensional space, okay? So here, W, the projection, uh, is, is, a, is a one by N matrix, so it projects into uh, a one-dimensional subspace, okay? It gives you a, a scalar, which is basically the position on the space. And so when you multiply by W transpose, you get the two-dimensional coordinates of that point in the original two-dimensional space. So when you compute the square distance between those two things, what you get is the distance between the data point and its projection on the, on the, on the space, okay? And that's your energy. So if a data point is on the, on the principal subspace here, its energy is zero. And as you grow away from the, that linear subspace, the energy grows quadratically, and that's indicated by the grayscale, okay? Uh, this linear subspace is simply the one that minimizes the sum of the square of the distances between all the, the training samples and uh, itself. Okay. And, and the, you know, the projections of the training samples on, on itself. So, uh, you know, this is not a very good approximation of this nonlinear non -linear subspace, right? Uh, obviously, but, you know, it's kind of a cooked, cooked example to show uh, uh, what would happen. So the bottom line here is that when you train PCA, you can train it by just minimizing the average energy of your training samples without having to push up or pull up on the energy of, of anything. Because by construction, since the linear subspace you project on has limited dimension, the volume of stuff that can take low energy has a limited volume um, because it has to be you know, a linear subspace of the dimension that you decided uh, uh, Z bar uh, should be. Right, so it's the idea of using a bottleneck to limit the capacity, the information capacity of the representation that your system uses from which it reconstructs the, the prediction. There is some confusion here about mm -hmm. uh, what is Y. So is Y your input here or is it yes. your sample of the output? What is it? Where Y is your input. Okay, so uh, this is two dimensional space. This is uh, Y1 horizontally, Y2 vertically, okay? And what the model is supposed to tell you is you give it a point Y and it tells you whether it's a good point or a bad point. In other words, whether it's a point that looks like something in a training set or not. Okay. I believe the question is like referring to actually the choice of letters, uh, Y rather than X. I think that's the confusion okay. here. I see, okay. Um, so the reason I use Y here is that Y is both, is Y is the variable that we are trying to model, okay? And, and, uh, and so, as I said, you know, in the sort of uh, energy-based framework, the X variable is one they would always observe on the training set or on the test set. Uh, y is the thing you observe on the training set, but you don't, you don't observe it on the test set, you're not given it, or maybe you observe, you observe only part of it. Uh, and it's the variable you're supposed to predict, okay? You're supposed to model. And so you write all the equations and you realize that to go from conditional to unconditional, the only thing you have to remove is X. Okay, you're left with the same formula, all the formulas for energy-based models, you know, the marginalization, the minimization with respect to latent variables, all the training things, everything. Everything carries, you just remove X when you only have a Y. And in unsupervised uh, situations like, like PCA, you only have a Y, you don't have an X. Okay, you're modeling Y. Basically what you're modeling here is the dependency between Y1 and Y2 
You know, what you're interested in is, 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 is saying, let's assume I give you Y1, tell me what Y2 could be. And here, if you had a good model, you would, okay, if Y1 was this, it would have to tell you, well, why, you know, Y2 could be this, or it could be that, right? PCA only tell, you know, tells you, well, it's here. Um, now, of course, this is in you know, two dimension with a principal uh, space of one dimension, so it's simple, but, uh, and so you know, PCA can give you actually more, um, more than one point, uh, but they are all in a linear subspace. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, you could also say, well, here is y1, here is y2, okay, y2 has this value, give me the possible values for y1, and of course, you know, this value for y1 is possible, and then the other intersect is this one. So again, you have two possibilities. So I would not be able here to build a function that predicts y2 from y1 or y1 from y2, a deterministic function, because there are multiple y1s that are compatible with y2 and vice versa. So I had to use an energy-based model where I just have a energy function that gives me the compatibility between y1 and y2 essentially, okay? Um, but there's no variable that I always observe. I don't know if I'm gonna know y1 or y2 or none of them. Okay, I hope that clears up a bit. I know it's, I know it's difficult to grab, once, once you get it, it's... Uh, there is another question actually, there is a follow-up question. Uh, so isn't unsupervised learning without labels? So basically it should be without Y and only X. Isn't Y the label? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, <laughs> Y is whatever you want to predict. Okay. And, uh, you, and, and it's, it's not supervised in the sense that, uh, okay. The difference between supervised and unsupervised has nothing to do with the data, you know, with, with, you know, whether you call the data, the, the, the variable you want to predict Y or not, it has to do with whether the variable you need to predict has been basically human provided. You can think of it this way. Okay. It's a very tenuous, it's not a mathematical definition, but supervised learning is you, 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 you know what the answer is. So you give the answer to the system and that answer is basically a definite answer. There is one correct answer. Uh, first of all, and, and, and second of all, that answer has been provided by a human or by, you know, some intelligent process. Uh, now in self-supervised learning, uh, the why is not provided by a human. It's part of the input. Uh, let's say you do video prediction, you know, why is whatever you don't see of that clip you do, uh, you know, you train, a, a bird system for, for natural language processing. Uh, you take a piece of text, you remove the, some of the words. Um, so now, you know, your, your, uh, your, your why is, is, is text. Technically, it's human provided, but in fact, you know, it's abundant data. It doesn't need to be kind of manually labeled, even though people have written those texts. So it's a, it's a bit of a tenu you know, it's a bit of an ambiguous uh, definition, really what supervised and non-supervised is. If why is discrete, uh, you can call it supervised, but you need an X. If you have only a Y, you can't, you can't really call this supervised. You have to call this unsupervised, okay? So unsupervised is you have a Y variable and you capture the mutual dependencies between the components of Y, okay? So you don't know in which direction you were gonna need to, uh, to make the prediction. And so you have to capture all the dependencies between the Ys. Uh, and the best way to do this in an abstract way is to have a function that gives you the constraints that those Ys have to satisfy so that uh, when you are given some otherwise, you can, you can predict the values for the otherwise by minimizing this energy, okay? Um, so that's unsupervised. And then supervised is when you have an X, you have an input, you're trying to predict the Y, and there is basically only one Y that works uh, that is given to you uh, during training, okay? And then self-supervised is uh, you're, giving, you're given a, a Y during training, but that Y may be one of many possible uh, outcomes, uh, you're only given one. And, and so the prediction has to deal with uncertainty. Um, uh, that's to be able to represent uncertainty more or less explicitly. Uh, and what's, what's more, the, the why is not something you had to spend a lot of money getting. Okay. It may be part of the input or it may okay, be it automatically. I, I summarize this on the chat as well. Tomorrow we're going to be going over these again. One second. Right. Again. 
Um, yeah, I probably was going to go over this again if, that, if that's not clear. Um, but if you only want, want to remember one thing, uh, when it's conditional, you have an X. The X is the thing you're, you observe all the time. And in unconditional or unsupervised, you only have a Y, you don't have an X. So classical unsupervised running algorithms basically are Y. And the reason, again, why we use Y is because all the formulas carry uh, that, we, that we have in the conditional case are the same, except there is no X in it, okay? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so why is the stuff you're trying to model? Uh, okay, I think we're done with this slide. Um, okay, so now what if we decide to allow our encoder and a decoder to be more complex than just a linear projection? Uh, and that's, that's called an autoencoder with a bottleneck. What happens there is that uh, you, you let the encoder and decoder functions to be neural nets, okay, multi-layer perhaps, but you still insist that the somewhere in the network there is a representation that is lower dimensional than the input and you decide on the, on the dimension. Um, so here's an example of, of, of how this, this, this works on this, uh, or what this does on this particular uh, training set. So I can't exactly remember what the architecture of, this, uh, of the encoder and the decoder was here. Um, I think it was like a couple layers, pretty wide, something like 100 units uh, in the first hidden layer. Uh, and the bottleneck is still one dimensional. It has to be because you know, the space is two dimensional. So if you want to reduce the dimension, you have to go to one. Um, so the system here is trying to kind of reduce to one dimension essentially the information as to what the training sample is. Uh, and it finds a solution that is not perfect, but you know, it's a little folded. So it has a low energy region that kind of follows this spir spiral and here kind of loses its marbles a little bit and kind of, you know, doesn't model this part very well and then sticks to this part, but not very well. And then it gives low energy to this part, which should, it shouldn't, okay? So it's not perfect. Certainly one dimension is not gonna work very well. This tends to work okay in, in sort of high dimensional uh, spaces. You know, not great, but you know, it kind of works. And again, uh, because the dimension here is, is lower, uh, which limits the volume of stuff that can take low energy, as you can see here, it's basically a one dimensional uh, surface, even though it might be very complicated, it's still a one dimensional surface, so it can't occupy the entire space. And so you can use just the average energy as the loss. Uh, just push down on the point on the data points and you don't need to push up on anything because automatically the energy will be higher. Okay, let's talk about k-means now. So k-means is a relatively simple algorithm, which uh, I hope all of you remember. Uh, if you don't, um, let me reformulate, reformulate it to you in, in, in energy-based terms. So you have a latent variable model. So now you have the elementary energy E and then the free energy F which you obtain by minimizing the elementary energy uh, with respect to the latent variable Z taken over a particular set. And we'll see what the set is. So the energy function is the reconstruction error, in this case, Euclidean distance, but again, it could be anything, of the, uh, of the difference between the data point and the decoding function applied to the latent variable, okay? Uh, so again, it's an unsupervised model with a latent variable. You have to do inference, which means you have to compute the latent variable that best, uh, you know, matches your data point using this uh, using this minimization. Uh, and in the case of k-means, that decoder is just a linear decoder; it's just a matrix. Okay, so the the energy is just a square distance between the data points and the z vector multiplied by a matrix. And here is the trick in k-means: you constrain the z vector to be a one-hot vector. Okay, so basically a vector with all zeros and one one at one location, and I forgot a comma here. Okay, so it's very simple. And basically the effect of constraining the Z vector to be one hot is that the Z vector selects one of the columns of W, right? When you multiply a matrix by a vector that has only one one, what you get is the, the, the corresponding column of that, uh, of that weight matrix, okay? So when you do this, uh, this minimization of the energy with respect to Z, what happens here is that you try to pick the, the column of W that minimizes the distance with Y. So imagine all the W's, the columns of W represent uh, points in the, in the space. Uh, 
what you're trying to, to do is find the point in that space, which is one of the columns of W that minimizes, that is at the, the smallest, that is closest to the data point you're, you're considering. So what energy surface does that give you, does that give us, right? Okay, so let's talk about training now. So training k-means is again, the energy loss. You, uh, you, you compute f of y for a particular y. So basically what that means is that you take a y, you find a prototype that is closest to it, right? You have to do this minimization of e over z to get f of y, okay? So find the, the prototype, which is a column of w that is closest to y, okay? Which is this, this inference process, this minimization. And then uh, do this for all the training sa set, the samples, and then minimize that, okay? You can do this with stochastic gradient descent if you want. Actually, it works pretty well if you have a large training set, but you can also do it directly. Um, so figure out what every point is, you know, which uh, prototype every point is, is closest to, and then compute every, recompute every prototype as the average of all the points that, to which it's assigned, okay? Now, of course, that's gonna change the assignment, so you do it again, and you keep doing it until the process converges. That's key means, okay? But essentially, what it is, is an energy function of this type with a latent variable constrained to be one hot, uh, an inference process by which you compute the latent variable that minimizes this, uh, this energy, okay? So this is the formula we've seen in the last two weeks. And then the, the training just minimizes the average energy of the training samples, and you don't need to push up on anything. You don't need contrastive anything because the volume of stuff that can take low energy is limited by the number of prototypes you have, okay? So this is visualized here. Uh, so here, this is k-means after training with this data set of samples drawn from this uh, spiral here in 2D. Uh, and what happens is that the prototype uh, kind of spread themselves around the, the spiral more or less equidistant uh, uh, to each other. Uh, and what you see is, you know, around each prototype, there is a little dip in the energy, right? Because on a prototype, the energy is equal to zero. So when y is equal to one of the prototype, the energy is zero. Right, because obviously there's going to be one z that selects the correct column so that this distance is zero, right? So when you're on a prototype, the energy is zero. And as you move y away from a prototype, the energy grows quadratically as, as if it were a, a quadratic ball, okay? And then if you get closer to another uh, prototype, all of a sudden it starts going down again, okay? So the energy in the end is the minimum of a bunch of quadratic balls centered on the prototypes. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. Um, so you have you know, a, 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 a little uh, uh, kind of dip in the energy, right? Equal to zero, a ball, uh, uh, every, every location where you have a prototype. And then in between two prototypes, you have a ridge, which is where those two quadratic ball intersect and one becomes smaller than the other. And so the energy becomes smaller because it's the minimum of a bunch of quadratic energies. Uh, and you also have a ridge uh, here, because here, this is just a point where you start getting closer to the, the top of the spiral or the bottom of the spiral. So the center of the spiral becomes a, a hard ridge, right? Okay, so this is why k-means works. This is why k-means doesn't need a, a contrastive phase. It's because the volume of stuff that can take low energy is limited by the number of uh, prototype uh, k, the dimension of z. Okay, any question at this point? Okay, so one point that I wanna make here is, is that uh, if Z is discrete, you know, it's a good way of limiting the, the information content of the latent variable and therefore the volume of uh, stuff that can take low energy. And it doesn't matter if your decoder is linear or not, okay? So, uh, you can choose a complicated decoder, a multi-layer neural net of some kind. If you discretize a latent variable, necessarily the volume of stuff that can take low energy will be limited to k points, where k is the number of different values that your latent variable can take, right? So that's a good way of, you know, essentially uh, not having to, to do contractive learning. The problem is that you have to decide what k is. And, the, the, you know, that may require actually trying multiple values, okay?
uh, gas and mixture model. So um, this may be a little bit difficult to uh, understand for some of you who haven't seen or don't remember what the gas and mixture model is because it's expressed in a you know a bit of a complex. Or maybe I'll I'll draw a picture um, separately. So gas and mixture model is is a is very similar to K-means except that instead of having quadratic balls that all have the same shape, you allow those quadratic balls to be uh, to take the shape they want, uh, as long as they, you know, with a quadratic form. So basically you allow those quadratic balls to be elongated in certain directions and not in others. Okay, so in a situation like uh, like this, this would actually be advantageous because the, 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 the Gaussian could be elongated along the dimension of the, of the, of the data manifold. And you could probably get away with modeling this uh, uh, data with fewer samples I mean, fewer prototypes, um, but then stick more to the the, the thing. Um, I didn't actually have a energy profile for K-means, so I for mixture Gaussian, so I, I reproduced the K-means here. But this is not K-means. This this is not mixture Gaussian. This is K-means. Um, uh, mixture Gaussian would look nicer, actually. So, what is the energy for mixture Gaussian? Uh, basically, you take a data point and you compute the distance of that data point to a mean. Okay, and the mean uh, is one column of W. And you, again, you have one of those latent variable uh, Z that is a one hot vector that's gonna select which of the mean. So it selects which of the components of this mixture of Gaussian, uh, you know, what Y is going to be, right? Um, so, okay, so imagine Z is a one hot vector. Z is going to select one column of W. This column of W is gonna be interpreted as the center of a Gaussian. Okay, and we will compute basically the difference between the, the data vector and the center of that Gaussian. And then we're going to compute a, a square distance, if you want, but distance uh, will be warped in some directions through a matrix here, MZ. Um, and I'll come back to this. So this think of this as a matrix, this product MZ as a matrix. M is actually a tensor, but MZ is a matrix. It's a symmetric uh, positive uh, definite, semi-definite matrix. Uh, which is basically the inverse covariance matrix of the Gaussian. Uh, and then this is a quadratic form that computes the, you know, warp distance, if you want, of between Y and the, the mean that you choose, uh, multiplied by this covariance matrix. Now this covariance matrix, the index IJ of that matrix is a sum over dimensions of Z of a tensor Mijk times Zk. Okay, so you can think of Zk of Z here as selecting because Z is a one-hot vector. You can think of Z as selecting a slice of that uh, tensor. Actually, to be uh, more efficient, I should have put k at the beginning here, but that's okay. Um, uh, so think of this as a three-dimensional vector that is a bunch of covariance matrices, if you want, and the Z vector is just going to select one of them. Right. So this process here, Z selects the mean, and here it selects the covariance matrix, and then you compute the, uh, the, the, the energy for this, okay? So that's E of YZ, and the overall energy of uh, mixture Gaussians is a marginalization over the Z variable, okay? So we're not minimizing anymore, we're marginalizing. Uh, so we're computing F of Y as minus one over beta log, sum over all Z, so the Z's that are all the one hot vectors of E to the minus beta, there's a missing minus here, of E of YZ, you can set beta to one if you want or something else, doesn't really matter, it's a little arbitrary. Um, but you know, I'm using this formula because the, this is the formula that we've used uh, 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 in the past. Um, so that's the energy of a Gaussian mixture model, okay? This may be a very different formulation that you've seen, but it's equivalent. Now, how do you train uh, a Gaussian mixture model? So it's trained with all kinds of tricks uh, using what's called EM, expectation maximization. You could train it with gradient descent, doesn't work very well. I mean, it works, it, it gets you to a local minimum, but it gets stuck in local minima and it's relatively slow. So people uh, prefer EM, which I'm not gonna go into here. Uh, but essentially the loss function you're minimizing is just the average energy of the points. In other words, which is basically the negative log likelihood that your Gaussian model gives to every point, okay? So you're maximizing, you're minimizing the negative log likelihood that your model, your gas and mixture model gives to every data point uh, on average, which is equivalent to maximizing the likelihood that your model gives to the data points um, 
uh, and and the product of, of of those over data points, assuming the data points are independent. Uh, so it's, make, it's doing maximum likelihood. Okay. Now, why is it a, an architectural model? Because you constrain this n matrix to be such that the the probability distribution here for each Gaussian is normalized, uh, and so you know you don't have you don't have a problem. I actually realized that I forgot. Uh, no, I didn't forget anything. Um, so the 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 n con contain uh, both. Um, no, I did forget something. There's a bunch of parameters here in the weighted sum that I forgot, um, which which have to be uh, have to be normalized as well. Uh, so you have to satisfy, uh, and I had them at the beginning. I don't know why I removed them. Um, so you have to uh, uh, essentially guarantee that this covariance matrix uh, is a covariance matrix for a Gaussian, which means that uh, its determinant is fixed essentially. If you change the covariance matrix. You have to normalize it so that its determinant is equal to a constant. Okay, doesn't matter what it is. If you are a probabilist, you insist that it, it be a particular value. But for energy model, you don't care I don't know, as long as it's constant. So so you have to maintain this normalization const, uh, constraint on the determinant of m. The determinant of m has to be constant, regardless of how you change it. Um, so uh, I lied a little bit. Uh, as I told you, I forgot the. The mixture coefficients here in this formula. So this is kind of a weird mixture model where all the components of the mixture have the same weight. Um, but um, I'll correct this in the slides later. Um, so you would have coefficients here that basically compute a, a weighted sum of the uh, of the exponential energies, and there is a minus sign here as well that I forgot. Okay, so that's for architectural methods. Um, now let's talk about regularized energy-based models. So the idea of uh, regularized energy-based models is that instead of constraining the volume of uh, space that has low energy to be less than something, you just have a term, a regularization term in your energy that makes you pay for making this volume large, okay? So in that way, it's regularized. And the question is, how do we do this? And why, you know, why why do we do this? Should be pretty clear by now, but I'm going to go over it again. Uh, so let's imagine we have this uh, model where we're trying to kind of make a, a prediction. So we observe an x. We're trying to make a prediction for y. Okay, uh, x goes through uh, some neural net, uh, which produces a representation of x in some in some form, and then we combine. Uh, this representation of the observation with the latent variable to make a prediction. As we vary the latent variable, the prediction will vary over a set. Okay, um, so if z varies over, I don't know, a, you know, a uniform distribution over a space or something uh, over low-dimensional space, uh, because the decoder here, here is a neural net, could be very complicated. We're going to have a surface here of uh, y bar. That's that's going to have at most the same intrinsic dimension as the the dimension of the space that we uh, vary z over, right? So if z varies over a two-dimensional space, y bar at best uh, can vary over a two-dimensional space and maybe less because it could be that the the decoding function will you know be degenerate and not be bijective and and basically you know uh, conflate. Uh, multiple values of z to the same point. Uh, so clearly that limits the, if you limit the dimension of z, that will limit the dimension of the space that can take low energy, right? So if I give you a y, I find a z that minimizes the distance between uh, y bar and y uh, by minimiz minimization. Uh, if y has a limited range, it could very well be that there is no z that will produce a y bar that is equal to y. But let's imagine uh, for a second that z uh, is the same dimension as y. Um, so if that's the case, and if the decoder is not degenerate, for any y I feed the system, there is going to be a z that produces the y bar, y bar that is completely equal to y. Okay, so what that means is that now my energy surface is going to be completely flat. It's going to be zero everywhere because any y I can feed my system, I, I feed my system with, there's going to be a z that produces zero energy. 
okay? Which are obtained by minimization, by inference, okay? So f of y is always zero in that case. So obviously, so the regularized uh, uh, latent variable model idea is to say, I'm going to uh, put a, a regularizer on Z in such a way that uh, the system will want to only use a subset of possible values for Z. I'm not gonna decide a priori Z is two or three dimensional or whatever. I'm not gonna decide it's discrete. I'm just gonna come up with some regularized fun regularization function R of Z that is going to make me pay a price in terms of energy for you know, choosing a Z that's outside of a limited range, if you want, all right? So replace a constraint by a, by a penalty, essentially. That's what it means. Uh, so that's kind of a pretty generic architecture here for a conditional energy-based model. And the name of the game here is how do we limit the information capacity of the latent variable? So that automatically, the volume of stuff that can take low energy is limited so that when you push down on the energy of good points, the energy of other points will necessarily be large because the volume is limited or minimized. Uh, so the, the idea of this is that, you know, by, by having this regularizer, you're going to minimize the volume of, of, of space that Z can occupy. And therefore you're going to minimize the volume of, of uh, space that can take low energy. Uh, of course, when you train the system to give low energy to your data point, at least those points will have low energy but everything else will have higher energy. So basically you're shrink wrapping the, the low energy region around the, the manifold of data, if you will. So that's the idea here. Add a regularizer to the Z variable uh, that makes you pay for going outside of a particular domain. Um, and now the question is, what do we put here? And depending on what we put here, how is it gonna work? You know, is it gonna be compatible with the rest that we're doing? Uh, so, you know, I talked about effective dimension. So one thing we could do is have, you know, multiple Z's of increasing dimension and then have an uh, RZ that kind of selects the one with the smallest dimension, but that, that's a little bit like, you know, searching for hyperparameters and may not be the best thing. Uh, quantization, discretization, we've talked about this, but the other problem is you have to choose like how many different values the system can take. Uh, uh, you know, the Bayesians do this with, uh, um, uh, you know, things like uh, Dirichlet um, allocation, where you have potentially infinite number of different values for Z, but they become increasingly uh, uh, high cost as, as you add them. So, so it has the uh, tendency of kind of minimizing the number of components that are required. Uh, in the context of Bayesian models, it's called uh, LDA, latent Dirichlet analysis. Uh, Dirichlet, if you pronounce uh, the French way, is Dirichlet because he was German, actually. But here is an interesting one that we're going to talk about. Uh, well, two interesting ones. So one is the L0 norm. What is the L0 norm of a vector? It's the number of components of that vector that are non-zero. So basically, what you're going to do here is count how many components of Z are non-zero. And then in your energy minimization process, you figure out what Z uh, can I use that has the minimum number of non-zero component that will minimize my reconstruction error. That would be the inference process, right? Give a, give a Y and then find uh, a Z, could be any vector, but uh, you're gonna pay a price uh, that is proportional to how many components of that vector are non-zero. Now, the problem with this is that it's not a differentiable criterion. And so it's, it's kind of hard to optimize this. There are methods, uh, approximate methods for this but um, uh, you know, to do this sort of L0 uh, minimization. So basically minimizing a squared reconstruction error while minimizing the number of non-zero component. One of them is, is called projection pursuit. Uh, it's basically a greedy algorithm. You figure out like, you know, what is the best first component I can use if I make it non-zero? So you have a finite number of components, you go through every single one of them and you say, you ask the question, what value should I give to that component so, so that my reconstruction error is minimized, okay? You pick that one. And then, you, and then you select the second one. Now, what second component can I pick so that my reconstruction error is minimized? And you keep doing this. That's called, proje that's called projection pursuit. Uh, if your decoder is linear. If your decoder is nonlinear, it still works, but it's not called projection pursuit anymore. Uh, business pursuit, it would be called, I guess. Um, now, the thing that's particularly interesting is uh, the regularizer, where the, which is the L1 norm of the, of, 
of the of the z vector. Okay, so basically you compute the sum of the absolute values of the components of z. Take your vector z, compute the absolute value of all of them, compute the sum of this, minimize that. So you know R of z would would be that. Okay, uh, this is called sparse coding, and I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, and the the nice thing about this, contrary to L0, is that it's convex. So, you know, it's a differentiable, uh, almost everywhere differentiable function, not at zero, uh, but otherwise differentiable. And the second advantage that it does is that it's, a, it's an approximation of L0 in the sense that when you minimize the L1 norm of a vector, uh, that minimization wants to make the largest number of components of Z zero as possible, okay? So it produces a sparse vector, essentially. A vector where, you know, a number of components are zero, perhaps most of the components are zero. So linear reconstruction with L1 regularization on the, uh, on the latent uh, variable is called uh, sparse coding. And learning that linear decoder is called sparse modeling. Uh, before I explain this in more detail, um, there's another uh, technique called, um, which consists in limiting the information content of Z by adding noise to it. So basically you say, variable Z, you're limited within a certain volume. I, I'm, I normalize, you know, I, 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 I uh, forbid you to go outside of a given sphere, for example, okay? So you pick Z within a sphere. But then whenever you choose a Z vector, you add some random noise to it. So a Z vector is not really a Z vector, it's a fuzzy sphere, okay? And so the effect of this is now that uh, because every Z vector is a fuzzy sphere, how many of those fuzzy spheres can you pack into the big sphere that you constrain the Z vector to be in? Basically it determines the capacity, information capacity of Z, okay? So adding noise to a vector limits the, the information that this vector carries, right? That's kind of intuitive. Uh, you know, if, if I speak when I do this, and you know, you can barely hear what I'm saying uh, because I'm adding noise, which is very distracting uh, to my voice. And so you have a hard time understanding what I'm saying. And so there is less information carried in my voice when I add noise to it. So it's the same idea here. You limit the information carried by the Z vector by adding random noise. Uh, you know, turning Z into a, a sphere by, you know, adding random noise, basically. Uh, this is the idea used by variational autoencoders. And uh, one of the most interesting research avenues today, I think, in my opinion, which is something I work on and a lot of uh, people working with me at uh, NYU and at Facebook work on, is what is the best way of limiting the information content of a latent variable in a predictive model of this type? Uh, I don't think it's a solved problem. I don't think we have a completely, you know, a wonderful solution for all situations. We have solutions that work in special cases. Um, but I think it's one of the most interesting or not interesting, but like one of the problems we really need to solve if you want to make progress in things like self-supervised learning and training uh, predictive models from video and stuff like that. There's a lot of paper on topics of that type. Uh, there is a question. Uh, I thought we are modeling the latent distribution and its posterior distribution. How is this related to adding L2 norm of a latent variable? So in the VAE, aren't we restricting uh, and modeling the latent distribution? I'll come to, I'll come to this, okay? This is the next hour. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So hold your breath for a bit. Uh, I'll explain that when we come to uh, two things, uh, amortized inference for Z and variational autoencoders. If they hold the breath for one hour, it's not going to end up very well, I uh, think. Hold your virtual breath, okay? Okay, I see. Um, okay, so sparse coding. Uh, so this is an unconditional regularized latent variable uh, energy-based model. There's no X. Again, we're only modeling Y, and there's no condition. And the energy function it looks very much like k-means. It's uh, the Euclidean distance between the data point and a matrix multiplied by the latent vector. The latent vector is not constrained to be one hot, it's a vector. Um, but there is an additional term, and this additional term is a coefficient times the L1 norm of Z, which I write as just a single, uh, single bars. So this is the sum of the absolute values of the components of Z, okay? Uh, 
So architecturally, it looks like this. You have a wave vector. You compute the square distance between this wave vector and whatever your model reconstructs. And then you have a decoder that happens to be linear. It's just a multiplication of a matrix by the latent vector. And the latent vector also has an energy term, which is the L1 norm of, of it. OK, that's your energy model. Right, so the, the, the generic model is just you know, a decoding function. It could be a nonlinear function, some neural net with multiple layers or whatever. You have a regularizer on the latent variable, and you, you, you know, have the reconstruction error here. But in the case of like classical sparse coding, the decoder is linear. Uh, the, the regularizer is L1 norm. And the reconstruction error is the square uh, Euclidean distance. Right, so how does that work? So this limits the volume of stuff that can take low energy. Um, but you still need to do inference, right? So you need to find, uh, for any particular data point y, you need to find the z that minimizes the sum of those two terms. Uh, this is done generally by an algorithm that, you know, it's, it's a gradient-based algorithm, but it's not gradient descent. It, it is definitely not stochastic gradient descent because the loss function is not an average over lots of terms, it's just one term. Uh, and there's an algorithm for this called ISTA, that means iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm. And it's basically a method, the general method that uh, uh, kind of you know minimizes functions like this that are sum of a differentiable quadratic term and another term that is not always differentiable. It's basically non-smooth. And what you do is you alternately take a gradient step uh, for this term. So that's a simple step, right? You can compute the derivative of this very simply with respect to to z. Uh, and then you you take in that step into account by essentially shrinking all the components of z by a constant towards zero. If they're already closer to zero than that, you just set them to zero. And you can prove that by alternating those two steps of a gradient step of the, of the quadratic term followed by a shrinkage of z by a constant, all the components of z sh uh, shrink towards zero by a constant, uh, eventually the system will converge to a solution to a minimum of the energy with respect to z for a given y, OK? So that's how you compute f. You minimize e with respect to z, right, as we do all the time. But this, in this case, it's a particular way of doing it, which is efficient. Uh, but it's still quite slow if, z is, if, if y is large, OK? Um, so what that allows you to do is use a z here, which has a larger dimension than y. Because in the end, uh, because of this term, it could be that the, the, the number of component non-zero components of Z that remain after you do this minimization would be relatively small, okay? Because I explained earlier, the L1 norm, when you minimize it, it wants to make a lot of components zero. That's a good way of minimizing the L1 norm. Um, so this is what some form of sparse coding uh, will give you, you know, the energy function you will give in this, you will see in this uh, little example, uh, uh, that I showed earlier, if you use sparse coding. Now, it looks kind of funny because it looks like there are like straight lines that are kind of following the, the, uh, the, the manifold here and maybe kind of a smaller one here. And in fact, um, it happens for the following reason. So imagine that uh, you, you only allow one component of Z to be non-zero here. Like the lambda is such that you crank it you crank it up in such a way that only one component is uh, remains non-zero, okay? Which you have to, in the case of a 2D uh, problem, uh, because if you let Z to be two-dimensional, then, you know, everything will have low energy. You know, everything will have low, low energy. That's not gonna work, right? So you have to crank up lambda here so that basically in the end, only one, one component of Z stays on. So it starts looking a bit like sparse coding, but there is a difference. It's not a one hot vector. The component of Z that are non-zero can vary. All right. So when you vary z, when you vary that component of z that is non-zero, you're basically varying the reconstruction along the dimension of w. Okay. Uh, and so I mean, you have to play a few tricks here for for this figure to um, to occur, which I'm not going to go into. But uh, but basically, as you vary that component of z that that uh, uh, that changes. You're, you're moving along the dimension of W, okay? And so that's what happens here. You have a low energy line, which corresponds to all the values of Z uh, that Z can take 
and that direction basically is W. Okay, so the, the detail I, I, I kind of swept under the rug here is that uh, I need also a constant. Uh, so I need another component of Z that is non-zero and another component here that I, I predict of Y so that I can predict lines that don't go through the origin. Okay, that kind of conform to this. But, um, but let's ignore this uh, for a moment. The point remains that as you vary the component of Z that is non-zero, you, you're basically varying uh, uh, points uh, that uh, a longer uh, a line in the direction of W, okay? And what that means is that there's gonna be a whole line here that can take low energy. If I take a point that is along the line corresponding to one, one W, it's gonna have low energy, right? Now, if I pick another component, I'm gonna have another line, okay? And another component, I'm gonna have another line, another component, another line, et cetera, et cetera. So what's cool is I can learn uh, different Ws. They're called dictionary elements, and this is called dictionary learning in some, uh, in some communities. And, um, and what, what's gonna happen now is that the, the uh, overall energy is gonna be, uh, uh, you know, I, I can sort of, you know, I can have regions, basically linear subspaces, low dimensional linear subspaces that, that have low energy. And the, the dimension of those low dimensional subspaces is the number of Zs that are non-zero. So if the number of Z that are non-zero is three, then I can vary those three components of Z however I want and basically span a, a linear three-dimensional subspace, right? Within the ambient space. And all of those points will have uh, low energy. Um, and then I can choose another set of three components and it's gonna give me another linear subspace, okay? Or I can choose only two components and now the subspace that has no energy is two dimensional. And my overall energy is basically the minimum of all of those, okay? Um, so that's uh, sparse coding. So whereas k-means approximates a point by a single prototype, okay, a data point by a prototype, and, and tells you the energy is the distance to that prototype. Sparse coding tells you I'm approximating any point by a linear subspace, and my energy is the square distance of a point to a projection on that linear subspace. But I have a bunch of linear subspace that I can choose from, okay? In that sense, it's very different from PCA. And, and you see them here. Uh, so, okay, there is one, very important detail that I need to mention, which is actually uh, mentioned uh, uh, here, decoder normalization. And this is how we train this. So we train this with a non-contrastive method, but we have a constraint to satisfy. So we, we train this with a non-contrastive me method, which means we give a data point Y, we find a Z that minimizes the energy, okay, that's inference, and then we take a gradient step with respect to W to make this, uh, this term smaller, okay? So we change W now to make this term smaller. Basically, we change the, the plane, you know, for the Zs that are non-zero, the linear subspace, um, to get it closer to our data point, okay? So if I have a data point, uh, if I had a data point here, I would pick this plane as the closest plane, and I would move that plane a little bit towards that by basically taking a gradient step of this term with respect to W, okay? Uh, that sounds very simple. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work because what the system does is that it cheats. It, it makes Z very, very short because that's a good way of minimizing that term. And to compensate for that, it makes W very, very large, okay? If I multiply W by two and I divide Z by two, I get the same result. I get the same reconstruction error, right? So the system can cheat by just, you know, making W very large, which allows it to make the L1 norm of Z very small by just shrinking all of Z, you know, the, all the components of Z, making it shorter. And it's not a good solution. It's a degenerate solution where, where all the Zs are zero. What do we do to prevent this? Uh, we can put some constraints on Z, you know, to kind of keep it large. It's complicated. Uh, it's difficult to make it work because it leads to non-convex uh, loss functions. So what people do is that they limit the, the, 
the norm of W. Okay, so you say UW, your columns, which are those prototypes, basically. I'm going to constrain the norm of those prototypes of your columns to be less than a constant, let's say one. Okay. So the way you train this is take a data point, find a Z that minimizes the uh, energy, square reconstruction error plus L1 norm. You have to do this using this ISTA algorithm, alternate multiple times, taking a gradient step of this with respect to Z, and then shrinking the components of Z, and then repeating until Z stabilizes. Okay, so now you have Z, the optimal Z for your Y. So now you have F of Y, essentially, okay? And the way to do is you minimize F of Y with respect to W with a gradient step. Uh, and what that means is that you compute the gradient of this term for the Z that you just computed with respect to W, all right? And take a step, stochastic gradient step. Uh, and it's very simple because it's a quadrat quadratic term, okay? Then the last step you have to do is now you go over every column of W, and if one column has a norm larger than one, you normalize it back to one, okay? The ones that are really short, you, you know, that are smaller than one, you don't need to worry about. Uh, although some methods actually normalize everything to one. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, more stable if you do that. Okay, so how does that work? Um, if you train a system like this on MNIST, okay, so here, Y are the MNIST digits. Uh, w is a, a large matrix and Z is a, a large vector and you have the L1 norm. So uh, here, the number of components is, I can't remember actually how many there were here. Um, but every square here is a column of W, okay? So the number of such squares is the dimension of Z. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say, I can't, I can't tell what dimension this is. Uh, I think it's 200 or something, right? You have 10 rows and I think it's 20 columns. Yeah, it's 200. Um, so you have 200 components of, uh, you know, Z is a vector with 200 components. It's smaller than the dimension of Y, which is 768, but, uh, but in fact, the intrinsic dimension of MNIST is much smaller than 768 because, you know, digits are kind of simple shapes and binary vectors, right? Or essentially binary. So you train the system and then you look at the, at the components, the, the, the columns of W, and what you get are, are these, okay? So white, uh, like a, a bright uh, color indicates a, a large positive value, and gray indicates zero, and dark indicates uh, a larger negative value. Uh, and what you see is the, 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 the components uh, here of W are basically little pieces of stroke, right? And what you can say is that any digit can be reconstructed as a weighted sum of those vectors, which are the columns of W, where the weighted sum has a small number of non-zero components, and those are the components of Z, okay? So the Z is sparse. It's got a small number of non-zero components. And any digit can be reconstructed as a linear combination of a small number of those components. And naturally, the system learns to basically learn strokes, okay? Because strokes are the elementary objects to, from which you can, you can build a character, right? So you need like different strokes of different width at different locations, but you know, it's approximate enough that, uh, that it works. Okay, so this is for MNIST. Uh, what if you apply this to uh, natural image patches, right? So you take uh, ImageNet or something, you take like little patches of, I don't know, 12 by 12 pixels or something like this, uh, and you apply this sort of sparse coding to it, and you observe how the columns of W change over time as you run the learning algorithm, you get something like this. Okay, so this is 256 uh, business function, which means the dimension of Z is 256. The dimension of Y is 144, which is 12 by 12. And uh, here you, we run sparse coding. It's actually a slightly different version that uses uh, something called uh, uh, amortized inference, but uh, it doesn't matter actually for the purpose of what we're talking about here. So you start from random initial conditions of the matrix, random, and then as the learning takes place, you get better and better uh, basis functions 
And what you realize is that the, the best way to reconstruct an image patch, a natural image patch, with a combination of a small number of, uh, of, uh, of, of vectors or templates is to actually make them look like strokes, like, like edges, okay? Looks like this. So basically any image patch can be reconstructed as a linear, co linear combination of a small number of those guys, okay? So these guys will give you kind of the general illumination or gradients. And then if you have an edge going through, basically those things will give you the edges, okay? Uh, and you have basically edges at sort of, of sort of various length and, and, uh, and, and spatial frequencies at every location and orientation, if you have enough basis functions. Now this is cool because this is pretty much what you, what you would want, right? If you want the system to learn good features, um, that's what you want for images. So this original idea of uh, this kind of sparse coding learning uh, algorithm using this uh, uh, L2 and L1 and constraining W to have a limited norm, uh, this is a, an algorithm that actually came out of theoretical neuroscience. It was proposed in the uh, late 90s by um, uh, two neuroscientists, uh, uh, Bruno Olshausen uh, and David Field. So Olshausen Field, um, the paper is from 1997, if I remember correctly. Uh, they had a series of papers. They had one at NIPS and they had one at, uh, in Nature or something like that. Um, and it, it changed what, you know, a lot of the people's mind about like, you know, can we learn low level features for images in an unsupervised fashion? This is an unsupervised learning algorithm, very simple. And what it appears to learn are image features that are very similar to what we, uh, what we see in, uh, uh, in the brain, in, in V1, for example. Now, what you're gonna say is, wait, are these features really? They're not features because they're not, they're not features that where you compute features from an input, they are features that in such a way that from a representation running through those basis functions, you reconstruct the input. It doesn't sound like something the brain will do. You don't reconstruct in the brain, right? You extract the features. You go from low layer to high layer, not, not the other way around. Um, but in fact, if you put an encoder to that, uh, to that system that basically from Y predicts the Z, that would be a feature extractor, okay? And we're gonna come to this in just a second. Um, and in fact, that's it, amortized inference. So what is amortized inference? Amortized inference says, you know, I don't want to run this optimization algorithm all the time that computes the optimal Z that minimizes the query construction error plus the regularizer. Why don't I, I train a neural net to predict this, opt this optimal Z from Y directly, okay? So it could be that my decoder is linear, it could be that my regularizer is L1, so I'm using sparse coding. Um, and of course, the, the function that maps a Y to an optimal Z by minimizing the energy with respect to Z is a very complicated nonlinear function. But why don't I learn that function with a neural net, okay? So basically then, if I can successfully train this neural net, I would be able to just plug a Y, run through this neural net and get the, the Z that would be kind of the best Z to linearly reconstruct um, my input. This is called amortized inference. Why amortized? Because you basically amortize the cost of running an inference algorithm by training a neural net to do most of the job for you, okay? Uh, I mean, there's several names to this, but that, okay. So now you look at this architecture and you say, well, that looks very much like an autoencoder. It's an autoencoder, right? You give a Y, you run through the encoder, you get some representation. And maybe you run that representation to the decoder, multiply the, uh, and, and then you know, compute the reconstruction error. Yes, it is an autoencoder, but it's a regularized autoencoder. And it's a funny kind of autoencoder here in the form that I drew it here, because it has this extra cost function here that measures the difference between uh, what, what comes out of the encoder and what the value of the latent variable is. Okay, so let's think about this as an energy-based model, where the energy now is the sum of three terms, the reconstruction error, the regularizer, we've seen this before, okay? Plus there is another term, which is some distance between the value of the latent variable and whatever the encoder produces. So this is the energy, that's the reconstruction error, okay? A cost function or distance of some kind, divergence, that measures the 
divergence between the data point and the output of the decoder applied to the latent variable. There's another a second term, which is the prediction error, uh, the prediction energy, which is the distance of some kind between the output of the encoder and the value of the latent variable. And then the last term is the value of the regularizer. Okay, so I have an energy model with those three terms. I compute the minimum of the energy with respect to Z, and I get a Z. Okay, so I get an uh, optimal Z here that minimizes the sum of those three terms. What do I do with that Z now? Well, uh, now that I have that Z, uh, I can, I can uh, run it to the decoder, I get a Y bar, I get a reconstruction error, I can backpropagate this error through the decoder and change the parameters of the decoder so that this error is minimized. Okay, sure, I can do that, right? If the decoder is linear, as we saw, I need to normalize it so that the system doesn't cheat by making the decoder weight very large. If the decoder is a neural net, I need to do a similar normalization, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, there are many people who tried things like this and didn't seem to be very successful so far. So it's not entirely clear how you do this process with a nonlinear decoder uh, yet. Um, and then what else do you do? When, once you have Z, you can use Z as a target to train the encoder to just minimize this, uh, this term in the energy, okay? So now you adapt the weights, you do a, a gradient step in the weights of the encoder. The encoder has to be multi-layer, non-linear, otherwise it doesn't work very well. And it's a step in the negative gradient of this term in the energy. So again, the, the loss function basically is just the energy, the average energy over training samples. And you can afford to do this because you limit the information content of the latent representation through this regularizer. And so you're guaranteed because of that, that your system will not give low energy to the entire space, right? You don't need a contrastive phase because that regularizer shrink wraps your data in a region of low energy space. Um, okay, so that's if you minimize with respect to Z. You can also marginalize with respect to Z, okay? With the formula that we've been carrying, carrying around, the negative log integral of exponential. And that's the basis for variational autoencoders, but I'm not gonna talk about this yet. Okay, so what architecture should we give to this encoder? Okay, uh, we know it has to be nonlinear, but what architecture should, do we need to, get to, uh, to give it? Let me talk about the ISTA algorithm. The ISTA algorithm is written here. Uh, if you have a sparse coding uh, system that whose dictionary matrix is, is WD, uh, you take a, this term here is the, this, this entire term here is the gradient of the, uh, of, of the, the square reconstruction error with respect to, to Z, all right? The reconstruction error is the squared error between Z and the, and the, the WD matrix applied to Z, uh, between Y and sorry, and the WD matrix applied to Z. You differentiate that squared error with respect to Z. What you get is uh, an error term, and then it has to be multiplied by this, uh, transpose W that pops up of the equation. Uh, and, and, and this whole thing works out. Um, so this is just a gradient of the square root construction error with respect to Z. Uh, and that's just a, a, a constant. Think of it as a step size, okay? So this is basically a gradient step, right? I mean, I'm sorry, this is the gradient. And this whole thing here is a gradient step uh, where you modify Z with the learning rate equal to one over L. Uh, L is some constant that in some versions of, of ISTA is computed in a particular way. Okay, but think of it as, think of one over L as a learning rate, essentially. I mean, a step size for your gradient algorithm. Okay, so you take that and then you shrink all the components of the resulting vector. So resulting vector you is, you know, a new, a new version of Z. You take all the components and you shrink them towards zero. If they are closer to zero than the amount by which to shrink, you, you just set them to zero. You don't overshoot, okay? So you could think of this as some sort of recurrent network. You take Y, uh, you multiply it by uh, uh, a matrix WE, which is equal to w tra w, uh, D transpose. Uh, <clears throat> you add, uh, and then you start from Z equals zero. You, uh, Right, because you know w, uh, y here is always multiplied by this matrix here. So I pre-multiply this. This is the matrix. This is W D transpose. Uh, then I shrink 
and then I get a new Z. I multiply this by this square matrix that I'm going to call S. Okay, and I add the result to the previous that I had, or I subtract, but you know, I just redefine S to have a negative sign in it. And I just iterate this, right? So it's basically this algorithm, ZT plus one equals shrinkage of WE transpose Y plus S of ZT with the definition WE equal one over L of WD and S equal identity minus one over L of WD transpose WD, okay? This is this recurrent net. And if I set those matrices, those two matrices to be equal to that, then the algorithm I run by running around this recurrent net is the ISTA algorithm, okay? Which is the known algorithm that converges to the optimal solution of Z for a given Y that, that is sparse. So what am I gonna do? I'm going to declare that this is actually a recurrent net and I'm just gonna learn those two matrices. But the trick I'm gonna do is that I'm only going to authorize this neural net to run for a finite amount of time, like four iterations or something around the loop. Okay, so now with a fixed number of iteration of that neural net, I'm gonna have some approximate solution of the sparse coding problem. And I'm gonna cheat by training the system to adjust those two uh, matrices in such a way that the solution I get is a better approximation than if I just run ISTA for four durations. And it actually, run, it actually works. So this idea goes back about 10 years uh, <clears throat> from my, my uh, from a postdoc, Carol Greger, and it was picked up by a bunch of other people uh, for various, various applications, uh, right? So you take this uh, recurrent net, uh, unroll it, a few times here, it's only twice, but you know you have to unroll it multiple times, uh, and then train it with backprop two time. It's just it's just as simple as that, okay. And what you get is an encoder essentially that predicts a Z that is pretty close to the solution that ISTA would give you by by running until convergence. Uh, so in fact, uh, this is a chart from this paper from ten years ago that uh, plus the reconstruction error as a function of number of steps that you run through this uh, recurrent net. And uh, this, is called, this is called LISTA for learning iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm, okay? Because we learn those matrices instead of uh, plugging the matrix that are predetermined. And so if you run, uh, if you train this neural net, uh, let's say with five iterations uh, to minimize the reconstruction error while being sparse, right? You get uh, an estimate of the, of the sparse vector here uh, with a reconstruction error that's pretty pretty small. Uh, if you run ISTA or the fast version of ISTA, fast ISTA, for the same number of iteration, you get a reconstruction error that's much, much higher. Okay, so there seems to be some magic in learning this encoder in the sense that you actually get a better approximation of the sparse vector by learning this recurrent net than by actually running the algorithm that is the best known fast algorithm to solve the problem. Sounds like impossible magic. How is that possible that a trained neural net can solve an optimization problem because this is an optimization problem that it solves approximately better than the algorithm that is designed to solve it that is the best known algorithm for this optimization? And the answer is uh, when you train the system, you train it to solve the problem for a particular type of data, right? We've trained this for natural image patches to decode, you know, to find uh, a, a sparse vector that represents natural image patches. We don't train it to work for any kind of random vector. We train it to work only for stuff that we are interested in. Natural image patches, you know, handwritten digits, whatever it is that we are interested in solving, audio signal. So, for this particular type of data that has been trained on, it's more efficient than the general algorithm, fast ISTA, which you know is designed to work in all cases and will work for random vectors, for random data, um, and and therefore we kind of you know exploit the fact that we know the type of data that we're going to work with. Uh, so that's the 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 beauty of amortized inference, which is that you train a neural net to solve an optimization problem approximately. And very often, because you are interested in solving that problem in particular situations, the result you get out of this neural net is faster and better quality 
than running the best known algorithm for the optimization um, because it gets specialized to solve that problem for the situation you're interested in. So it's a very general concept, this idea of amortized inference. Uh, you want to keep this in mind uh, because uh, you know it's starting to get used in all kinds of situations uh, where you would normally run an optimization algorithm, but instead you train a neural net to basically give you an approximation of the solution. Um, you know, more generally, it could be it could be called like you know amortized optimization actually rather than amortized inference. Can you go over once again about the shrinkage? How do we do? How do we perform the shrinkage? So the shrinkage function has this shape. Okay, take one component zi and pass it to this function. That function subtracts a constant to positive values, adds a constant to negative values, and if the input the argument is, you know, within those two sh shrinkage values, it doesn't do it, it's, you know, it sets, it sets it to zero, right? Okay, so this is the shrinkage value right here, uh, which I guess for, for Lista, I mean, for Lista is uh, lambda over L, where lambda is the constant in the, you know, that the, the L1 norm of Z is multiplied by, and L is the, is the inverse learning rate that you use here in the gradient step. Um, and you just, you just shrink. And you can think of it as a gradient step uh, of the shrinkage um, of, of, the, 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 of the shrinkage term with respect to Z. It is actually a gradient step. Um, with, with, with the thing that you, know, you, don't go, you, don't, you don't overshoot, right? So if the value is already smaller than lambda over L, you, you set it to zero. You don't, you don't go the, to the other side. Okay, so it's a funny kind of clipped, uh, clipped gradient. But essentially it's two of those alternating gradients of the L2 term, L2 reconstruction, and the L1 regularization. Uh, is that clear? That function exists in PyTorch, by the way. Okay, <laughs> the shrinkage function. Now here's something really cool is the convolutional version of this. So now we're gonna still use a linear decoder, but our linear decoder is gonna be a convolutional layer. Uh, so basically we're gonna think of Y as an image and we're gonna reconstruct this image as a weighted sum of uh, feature maps, ZKs. And we're, gonna, uh, we're going to convolve each of those feature maps with a convolution kernel Okay, and then sum them up, and that's gonna be our reconstruction. So basically, take a bunch of feature maps, run them through a convolutional layer, okay, uh, with a single output feature map, which is your Y, essentially, and it's linear. Okay, this is nothing more than a convolutional layer. Uh, and so now our en energy is gonna be the square distance between this Y image and the weighted sum of, and basically running through the convolutional layer, okay. Uh, and again, we're gonna have an L1 norm over Z. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the bottom, the bottom row. Okay, so this is a convolution operation where you convolve uh, the convolution kernel with each of the feature maps of Z. And you see the form is really the same as sparse coding. So sparse coding is, is, is where, you know, the sum here runs over the, the, the columns of W and the components of Z, right? And here, the sum also runs over the, the components of this uh, convolutional kernel tensor uh, and the feature maps of the, the tensor of, uh, of these, okay? So K is the index of the feature map, essentially. Uh, but it's really the same thing, right? Convolution is a linear operation. It's like a, a big empty matrix with same, same term everywhere. Um, that works really beautifully because when you apply this, so you apply this to an image and you run the learning algorithm where you normalize the, the, the kernels so that they don't grow too large, same trick as in uh, uh, sparse modeling. Um, so you, you, show, you show an image, why? You find the Z that, uh, which is a whole set of feature maps, the same size as the image that minimize the reconstruction error under this L1 uh, term. Okay, you get a Z, and now you take one step of gradient descent to change the convolution kernel so that this term goes down. Uh, 
and you normalize the convolution kernel so that the norm doesn't grow, so the system can achieve by for you know by making z shorter. Uh, and then you look at the convolution kernels. And that's what that's what happens. So if you have only one convolution kernel, it basically learns to just you know reproduce pixel by pixel. There's not much that you can do. Uh, these are uh, five by five filters. If I'm not, oh, no, they're bigger than that. They're like eight by eight or something like that. Um, if you if you allow the system to use two two filters, two kernels, um, you get kind of two types of contrast detection. If you want, uh, if you let them have four, if you let it have four, you have very simple little vertical and horizontal edge detectors with two polarities. Okay. Um, and the system doesn't need to learn that it needs to have uh, edge detectors at every location because it already has them at every location because of the convolution. So what it learns are convolution kernels that it knows are going to be used everywhere, right? So it doesn't need to replicate uh, you know, multiple instances at multiple locations. If you have eight filters, uh, you get this. So you start getting oriented edge detectors, right? 16 filters, you get that. Now you get oriented edge detectors, but you also get center surround uh, filters. So that those things here, you know, these guys, they basically detect local contrast. They're like what's called Laplacian filters. Uh, your eye does that, uh, your retina does that, and then your lateral geniculate nucleus, which is where your optical nerve projects before going to your brain, does that too. Okay. And the, your primary visual cortex area, V1, in the back of your brain, does all of that stuff, all this oriented edge. Now, increase this to 32 filters, and you start getting you know, a little more diversity uh, in, the, in the filters, you know, more, more of those centers around with sort of different sizes of the center and the surround. Uh, and then if you go to 64 filters, you start seeing things like uh, double edges, okay? I mean, you also have double edges here, which you didn't have here. So here you have single, you know, single edges, essentially. You know, one side is black, the other one is white. Uh, uh, whereas here you have double edges. So that detects kind of a, a, a narrow um, uh, line, if you want. And then with 64 filters, you start having things like endpoint detect, corner detector. This is a corner detector. But you get like you know more diverse uh, more diverse filters when you when you do this. So this is wonderful because that means you know you can learn uh, uh, features completely unsupervised by just having a, a sparse decoder. And then if you use uh, so one thing I didn't tell you here, um, I kind of slightly lied is that I'm using amortized inference for this. Okay, uh, so this is from a paper also from about ten years ago and. Uh, uh, with my former student, Corai uh, Kavichalu, as well as Marco Lorenzetto. Corai Kavichalu, by the way, is the uh, head of research at DeepMind. Um, I apologize for the pronunciation. I never figured out how to pronounce it properly, but I'm sure there are Turkish speakers in the audience that can tell me a better way of pronouncing it. Um, so, uh, Right, so those, uh, so in fact, I'm using amortized inference, but I'm not using this kind of complicated Lista encoder. I'm just using a, essentially what amounts to a, a two-layer encoder with a single layer of uh, convolutions, followed by nonlinearity, followed by, which is actually a hyperbolic tangent, followed by basically a diagonal matrix that just kind of sets the gains, but doesn't, doesn't do anything else. So what happens is kind of interesting, which is that the filters in the encoder, which is a single convolution, end up being very similar to the filters in the decoder. And this is a feature extractor, right? You can think of it as a feature extractor. You apply the image to it, you apply a convolution, uh, you pass it to a nonlinearity, and that's your features. Um, so this is a completely unsupervised way of training basically a layer of a convolutional net. Uh, completely unsupervised using essentially what amounts to a sparse autoencoder or sparse coding with amortized inference, which is kind of the same thing. Okay, so this would be the, the kernels that are learned by that, by that system and they look really great and they look very similar to the one in the decoder. So this is a very simple algorithm, a very simple procedure, uh, which basically very simple architecture. Uh, take an image, run it through a convolution, pass it to a nonlinearity, in this case, hyperbolic tangent, 
pass it through a linear layer that just it basically is just a scaling. Um, it doesn't actually, it's not a full matrix, it's just diagonal matrix essentially. Then have a latent variable to which you have uh, uh, a sparsity, L1 sparsity, then run this through a linear decoder, which is a bunch of convolutions, reconstruct the image, compute the reconstruction error. And the process is exactly what I was describing uh, a few minutes ago. Run to the encoder, make a prediction for the, the, the Z, copy that Z into the Z as an initialization for sparse coding. Now minimize the sum of those three terms with respect to Z. So find the optimal Z that minimizes the reconstruction error, the sparsity, and the prediction error, those three terms, okay? Uh, and now that you have Z, uh, use this Z as a target for the encoder. You just backpropagate the gradient of this cost with respect to uh, the weights of the encoder. And then do a gradient step of the decoder so that this term uh, gets smaller, okay? And then don't forget to normalize the, the convolution kernels of the decoder, otherwise they're going to explode and the Z is gonna shrink. Uh, and even if your encoder is basically a, a single layer neural net, this, this works pretty well and gives you this result. So you can use this to pre-train a, a neural net, all right? And there was a time when uh, data sets were not as large as the ones that we have today, but those techniques actually would improve the performance of things like pedestrian detection or uh, other applications. Um, so let me tell you about like other approaches uh, to learning features using uh, this sort of uh, amortized inference prediction type idea. Uh, and this is you know a bunch of papers that are about five years old, although there's been some more recent ones. But um, but here is the idea: you you want to train a system to learn uh, visual features from video by do, basically doing video prediction, okay? So what you can do is uh, take two frames of that video uh, and then uh, look at the third frame and then train a, a system to learn representations of each of the frames in such a way that through a learned uh, neural net, you can predict the representation in the next frame. Uh, so you can, uh, so this is not a latent variable model actually, uh, although it should be in principle, but this one is not. Uh, so uh, take two frames, run them through an autoencoder and train this autoencoder, you know, backprop through this autoencoder so that this frame is being reconstructed. So you guarantee that this H is a good representation of Y regardless of what it is. Uh, you do the same for multiple frames. Now you have the H's, you run them through a neural net and you run this neural net through a decoder that is predicting the next frame. Okay, and what you're gonna do is do uh, amortized inference. So you're gonna run this through uh, an encoder. You're gonna train this encoder to predict what this representation is too. But in fact, you don't really need this. You could just run, run this. So this is sort of an example of doing video prediction. Uh, and for, you, know, you, you can train a system like this to learn features. Uh, you can look at the filters, the, the, the features that are learned uh, at the encoder level, for example. And these various criteria you can use to kind of uh, impose on H, uh, so, so you know in that uh, in that process, or impose on G. Uh, and you you can learn pretty good features from this. Um, this is still this this still kind of you know working in progress along those directions, but uh, it's not completely worked out. Uh, but again, it's kind of a non-contrastive uh, way of training uh, feature extractors because you're not training a system to just reconstruct; you're training it to predict. And because you're training it to predict, uh, it, it can't come up with just trivial trivial solutions. And so, you know, methods like this, you know, come up with like pretty cool, like I, I didn't tell you anything about the details of how this works, but, um, but it, you know, some of those come, come up with sort of pretty cool type uh, uh, features. Um, we can talk more about this uh, later if you're interested in, in the details. So just to kind of suggest the idea that, you know, uh, if what you're training the system on is not reconstruction but prediction, then the problem of, and you don't have latent variables, then you don't have the problem of limiting the information content of a latent variable because you're doing prediction. Um, okay, let me say a few words in the 15 minutes we have left on variational autoencoders and uh, uh, Alfredo will come back on this uh, in more details in the, I guess, yeah. next week, right? Yes, yes. Tomorrow we're going to be covering the basic autoencoder and next week the variational one. Right. So I may talk a little bit more about this uh, next week again, but uh, let me give you the gist of it. Uh, 
Uh, and it's a very informal presentation of what variational encoders really are about, okay? There's also a more mathematical presentation of it. There's also a mathematical and probabilistic version of it. And so today we're only gonna see the intuitive version. And uh, maybe next week, if, uh, if I have time, we'll, we'll talk about this sort of slightly more formal version, but sort of still in the energy-based uh, framework, which actually is not just applicable to variational autoencoder, but to gener general variational methods in the context of energy-based models. Um, so why is it called variational autoencoder first? Okay, it's called variational autoencoder because um, you're, you're approximating a complicated distribution by a simpler one. And uh, in the context of uh, physics, that's called variational uh, uh, approximations in, in statistical physics. So that's where the name comes from. But we're not going to talk about this yet. We're just going to uh, think about this in terms of uh, kind of uh, energy-based uh, energy models. A variational autoencoder is basically a model of the type that we just talked about. It can be uh, it can be conditional or non-conditional. So the grayed out part here is the conditional. If it's conditional, then you have uh, an X variable that runs through a predictor extractor representation. That representation goes into, influences the, the, the decoder and the encoder, okay? In the unconditional version, you just don't have that. You don't have X, okay? Uh, so it's just basically an autoencoder. In fact, it's called an autoencoder. And in terms of energies, it's an autoencoder, it's a regularized autoencoder with a funny form. So it's a regularized autoencoder where you start with Y, you run through an encoder, which can have multiple layers. It makes a prediction about the latent variable. Your latent variable is a free variable, and there is three terms in the energy. One term is the square distance multiplied by some constant to the, to the output of the encoder. That constant can be a matrix, by the way. Um, so in, the, in which case, this could be a quadratic form with some sort of covariance matrix uh, in the middle. Uh, but for now, we're just going to say it's just a it's just a constant, or maybe a parameter we're going to learn. Then there's another term which is the the L2 norm norm of uh, I said z bar here, but this is really z the L2 norm of z. Okay, and then we run through the decoder and measure the reconstruction error. Okay, so that's the energy model. So the energy is reconstruction error of running the z through the decoder plus the L2 norm of Z plus the L2 norm of the distance between Z and Z bar, and Z bar is the output of the encoder applied to the input. Okay, simple enough. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Um, instead of minimizing the energy with respect to Z, we're going to marginalize the energy with respect to Z. Okay? So basically, our free energy function is going to be the negative log of the sum of the exponential of the energies for all possible values of z, uh, you know, taken over a domain, right? Taken over a large space. And obviously that's completely intractable. It's intractable because, um, so what does that mean? That means that the integral of the exponential of e to the minus this is simple. It's a Gaussian integral, right? This is a quadratic term. So when I integrate e to the minus this quadratic term over an entire space, I get a Gaussian. So I know what the integral is, okay? It's the determinant of this, which is one. Same for this guy. If I integrate e to the minus this guy over the entire space, I also get a Gaussian integral. I know what it is. The problem is this guy, I have no idea what this is because I'm running Z through this really complicated neural net. And so when I compute, when I want to compute the integral of E to the minus the energy term that comes from this, I can't really, it's too complicated. It's intractable, okay? So here is where the variational approximation comes in. You just drop it, okay? You're just going to consider a marginalization over a distribution, which is not the real distribution uh, that it should be, which would be e to the minus the complete energy. It's gonna be e to the minus the complete energy, but you're gonna drop this term because it's too complicated, okay? So you're gonna replace, basically, the distribution over which you marginalize by a simpler one that you can actually integrate, okay? Because it's basically a product of two Gaussians, 
Okay, the energy is the sum of two Gaussians, so the 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 distribution is the product of two Gaussians because it's the exponential of of the energy, which is the sum of two terms, right? You get the product of the exponentials. And the product of two Gaussians is Gaussian. So that's just a Gaussian, right? Now, how, how are we going to approximate the distribution, that Gaussian distribution? Because what we need to do is compute the, the sum uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, energy for, like basically what we need to do is compute uh, the gradient of our energy with respect to the parameters of our network for all possible values of the latent variable, okay? And sum that up for all possible values or average it for all possible values of the latent variable. But we need to give a weight to every value of the latent variable that depends on the probability of that latent variable under the distribution, which is just e to the minus the energy, okay? So that's what we need to do. Uh, you know, the, the marginalization would be F uh, of Y would be minus, uh, I'm gonna assume beta equal one, okay. Log sum over Z of E to the minus beta uh, E of Y and Z, okay. There is an X if it's a conditional model. And the reason for using this form of the free energy is so that uh, we can compute the probability of Y as being sum over Z of the probability of the joint probability of Y and Z. Um, but we also want it to be uh, E to the minus the free energy of Y divided by sum over Y of e to the minus free energy of y. Okay. And so the proper definition for f, if you want those two things to be uh, to be uh, equivalent, is as I showed last week, is to define f this way, and that corresponds to marginalizing over the distribution of y uh, of of z, and that distribution of z, the so-called posterior distribution of z. Uh, so p of z even y. Uh, is e to the minus e of yz divided by sum over z of e to the minus e of yz. I should say z prime here so that we don't get confused. Okay, that's called the posterior of z. But here is the problem. We, don't, we cannot compute this uh, because this integral involves uh, an energy term in there, this term, which is a quadratic term in terms of y bar, but it's non-quadratic in terms of z because we run z through, the, through this complicated neural net. And so, you know, E has th three terms. It's got the reconstruction error. Uh, it's got the prediction error. And it's got the square norm with the coefficient of Z. It's, it's the It's this term that I can't deal with, okay? When I plug this E into this equation here, I cannot compute the denominator because that term is just too complicated, okay? Whereas the other two terms, that's just a Gaussian integral, okay? So it's quadratic in Z. And so it's just the integral of a Gaussian. I can compute this is, you know, in this case, it's basically lambda <laughs> times K or something like that. Um, so, uh, so that's the approximation. I'm gonna use a proxy for the energy or a proxy for P of Z given Y, which is gonna be a Q of Z given Y. Okay, and that Q is gonna be E to the minus uh, 
e tilde of y z divided by the integral of e to the minus uh, e tilde of y z. And this is e tilde. Okay, so I'm making this horrible approximation that's called a variational approximation. Okay, I'm replacing a posterior on Z by another one that is simpler and I can actually compute. Okay, now what I need to do is, uh, you know, basically say, well, for each possible value of Z, I need to compute the, the gradient of my reconstruction error or my energy uh, if yz with respect to the weights. And I need to weigh that by p of yz, p of y given z, and compute the, the sum of this over z. And that would be really the gradient, the gradient of the marginalized uh, uh, free energy with respect to the parameters is really the weighted gradient of the of the energy for all values of z weighted by the z given y, okay? So I had this formula just a minute ago, okay? z given y. Um, I can't do this, so I'm gonna substitute this other one. The q. And I'm going to approximate this by a discrete sum. where the sum is taken over samples from Q. Okay. So basically it's very simple. You, you have a Y, you run through the encoder, you get a Z and now what you're gonna do a Z bar. And now you're gonna sample a particular value of Z from the distribution whose energy is the sum of those two terms. Okay. And it's sampling from a Gaussian, super simple. The mean of this Gaussian is Z, is Z bar. Okay, uh, actually because of this term, it may be a little shifted from Z bar. Um, and then you run through the, you run that through the decoder, get a reconstruction, back propagate the gradient, compute the gradient with respect to the encoder and decoder weights, make an update. Okay. Pretty simple, right? And what that gives you is this approximation, which is the gradient that you want, which is the gradient of the free energy once you marginalized over this latent variable. Uh, another interpretation, which is more intuitive of this, is that each training sample is a point in, in Z space, uh, a vector in Z space, okay? Represented as 2D uh, plane here. So each of those blue dots is the code that corresponds to training samples at, you know, produced by the encoder. When you add noise to each of those points, you basically turn them into fuzzy balls. And you, you run a random point within this fuzzy ball through the decoder, okay? Now, if, if you do have overlapping fuzzy balls here, it means that the decoder is not gonna be able to reconstruct those points very well because once in a while, uh, the samples are gonna be in the overlapping uh, uh, region and so the reconstruction will be bad, okay? So this will cause the system to blow the, all the points away from each other, okay? So it'd be the opposite of sparse, sparse coding. The points will fly away from each other to avoid this confusion, but it's not a good solution. So what you do is you add a term that basically adds a spring that attaches each of those uh, uh, fuzzy sphere to the center so that they can't just fly away. They have to be as close as possible to each other. And that basically regularizes the whole thing. And this is the L2 term, this term. So this term prevents the, the fuzzy spheres from flying away. And in fact, uh, I should probably put this term on, on Z bar, not on Z. So it's just a term that intervenes in the loss, but not in the energy. Okay, we're out of time by four minutes. So I'm gonna stop here and thank you for your attention. And Alfredo will explain this in more detail. All right, take care.